The Secrets of Movies and TV Shows is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to The Secrets of Movies and TV Shows. Hi, I'm Dom Bettinelli, and you're listening to The Secrets of The Gray Man, where we will discuss the hidden layers and deeper meanings found in this new Netflix movie. And joining me today on the panel are Father Chip Hines. Hi, Father Chip. Hello, Dom. And Thomas Center. Oh, hey, Thomas. Hey, Dom. Folks, be sure to follow The Secrets of Movies and TV Shows in Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, your favorite podcast app. Also at the StarQuest YouTube channel, where you should also hit the bell to get notifications. I want to tell you about another show on the network you are sure to enjoy called The Secrets of Technology. You can find that at sqpn.com slash technology or wherever fine podcasts are found. We do have a bit of feedback from a previous episode. We had some nice feedback from YouTube. Uh, this was on our recent discussion of The Secrets of Apollo 13. And uh, Buddha Rocket on YouTube writes, Hey, neat stuff. I also live in Clear Lake. My par parents worked at Mission Control during this mission. My mom was pregnant with me at the time, and my dad worked on the medical telemetry that the astronauts took off. Their apartment was a flop house for people to get some sleep during the mission. I like the podcast and the other shows too. Well, thanks, Buddha Rocket. That's really cool that personal connection. Uh, you mentioned Cl Claire Lake because uh, Shelly Kelly was on that episode and she's she's actually a historian for uh, a lot of NASA stuff. She's a librarian, has a lot of NASA stuff in her archive and had talked about that and being in Clear Lake and that sort of stuff. So uh, really cool. That's a great memory. Excellent. So let's get into talking about The Gray Man. And uh, this is a Netflix movie that just came out of in on Netflix, but also in some theaters. This is the thing that they do so that they can submit the stuff for the Academy Awards, I guess, or whatever it is. Um, so it's based on a book series by uh, the author Mark Greeny. And Father Chip, you introduced me to the series. I didn't know about this series before you told me about it. Um, and the first novel, which some of this movie has elements of. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> yeah right. it's it's it, it is strange uh yeah it's uh it's kind of a mixed bag of of the gray man and uh it's interesting i i i i yeah i mean i'm reading i haven't read all the books yet but um i've read a good chunk of them and uh yeah this is this is a little different yeah uh well and we'll get into that too because it's it's really interesting the differences um yeah this, but the uh, there is a it's like a twelve books so far. I think it is. I mean, the there's eleven books out. The twelfth book comes out in 2023. Okay, yeah, usually around February or so he comes out with another one. Uh, right. So the author is Mark Greeny, and Mark's has an interesting background. He started as the research assistant for Tom Clancy, and right. and oh, that's then cool. a second writer. <laughs> and then when Tom Clancy died, he took over the Jack Ryan series for a while. Uh, and then struck out on his own. So he's got a a, a really good pedigree in this area, uh, you know, this, this sort of writing. And uh, so it's kind of cool. Um, j just a, uh, this week, as we're talking about this, Netflix announced that they've greenlit a sequel to this movie already. So All uh, right. Gosling will be back. Chris Evans will not, presumably. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you never know. You never know. Uh, I don't know about Anna de Armas, but there's also a spinoff that they announced. And I'm trying to rack in my brain. Who could be the spinoff? Oh, no, no. Yeah, that's that's the um, the uh, Bally Song character, for sure. The one that, oh. that gives the... The, yeah, that gives the item over to her at the end. The Tamir I'm sure Lone Wolf. Yeah. Yes. There you go. Or oh, Lone Wolf. Yeah. Okay. That makes more sense. Danush, I think his name is, uh, the actor. He's got the, the single name. Um, oh, that would be very interesting. I'm kind of curious because he was kind of cool. We'll get to him because he was kind of cool. So we mentioned the cast. Ryan Gosling plays six in this. By the way, the character in the books, his name is Cortland Gentry or Court. Um, he used to be Sierra six when he worked for the CIA, but he's Gentry in this, his, that name is never used. He's always six from the beginning, isn't he? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's weird. Yeah. They use it once. Uh, he actually, uh, 
uh, Billy Bob Thornton's character, Fitzroy, he, he says it in that opening scene when he's in, when he's got right. him in the room, he says, he opens the f- folder, reads his name, and that's it. That's the only time you hear it. Oh, okay. Yeah. So very interesting. Um, one of the things that makes the gray man, the gray man in the novels is, so he's a, he's a, an assassin for hire, uh, but, and he's the best in the world, acknowledged as the best in the world by everybody in the business. And he's the gray man because he blends in everywhere. He doesn't stand out. He doesn't look like an assassin. He looks very average. And that's that's one of the fundamental problems of movies, which is all the actors look too good. They're all good looking, you know, leading men, you know, well, uh, especially if you put Ryan Gosling in there. I mean, right. he's right. <laughs> internationally known as someone who's very handsome by by the women in the world. And um, he's a handsome know, man. I, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just he'd stand out a little bit. Right. I mean, it would be interesting to put like a guy who looks like, you know, you or me. I'm not going to I'm not going to Thomas, you're 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 you know, I'm not going to you know, do that to you. But, you know, we're pretty average looking. And, uh, you know, someone like us would, would, wouldn't stand out very much. Oh, know? no, we'd blend. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny, though, because like you even even with uh, the way I look, I look like a lot of people. And so I always get compared to, you know, this, this person or this person, you look like that person or, or this actor or that. Yeah. So it, it's, it, that can be useful in and of itself for that kind of blending, right. Where it's like, That's you know, true. I that guy, but <laughs> <laughs> you know, who would have been good in that? And I, I hate to say, like, I see, I hate to start overcasting this stuff, but I, I think, um, uh, oh, now I'm blanking on his name. He, he, uh, he was in Parks and Rec. He's in Galaxy. Uh, oh, Chris Pratt. Chris Pratt. Chris Pratt looks like an everyman. He does. To me. He, I mean, he can look buff, like in the Terminal List, like the, that's right. the new Amazon series. I mean, he looks buff, but, you know, he can look. His face. Yeah, he can look like it's just a regular dude. So, um, yeah. yeah. The Andy from Parks and Rec, you know. That's yeah. <laughs> no, I think he's one of the more regular looking guys in Hollywood. Yeah, oh, yeah. I, I agree. I agree. Um, so, uh, in the, so I was, I kind of mentioned in the, in the books, Gentry is a singleton. They call him. He's a, he, he used to, when he worked for the CIA, he was alone, alone, uh, assassin. He got jobs and he worked alone. That was his main thing was to work alone. Then he got assigned to a Sierra team, which is a, an, you know, a, a team of ex-military special forces who, you know, do special missions, uh, military type missions, wet work. Right. Uh, and then later goes rogue. Uh, that's, that's, and that's where the first book starts. The first gray man novel starts. This one starts out with him still, well, it starts with him in prison, but it starts with him still with the CIA. And that, this is kind of the story of him going rogue. So it's Mm -hmm. kind of an interesting, that's an interesting change from the books right off the bat. Um, but you mentioned also that scene that that sets the the stage right at the beginning of back in two thousand three, I think it is, where Gentry's in prison and Billy Bob's character Fitzroy comes to visit him and recruit him. Um, so, uh, what did you think of the de aging of Billy Bob in that one? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it kind of. I mean, it looked okay. It didn't look awful. I mean, I, I, I they're getting better at this. Every year that goes by, every week probably that goes by, they're getting better at it. And uh, I didn't think it looked that bad. And probably, um, you know, with a guy, you know, a Hollywood guy, they could probably, I mean, it's it's easy enough to do. They know what he looks like when he's young because they have it on film. Sure. And they can and they can compare it, you know, not like you and I, who, you know, Dom, who probably it would take, you know, weeks and millions of bits of computer <laughs> technology to de-age. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I think yeah. uh, Hollywood people, probably it's a little bit easier. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, a, I'm of two minds on this whole de-aging thing. Um, you know, I thought it looked good in uh, The Mandalorian and, uh, and Boba Fett, Book of Boba Fett. But I, I think it's, it's, uh, it just depends. It just it re- really depends movie to movie and show to show um, how they implement it and how they do it. And uh, I didn't think it was that bad. I, I mean, as far as a plot element goes. Yeah. How about you, Thomas? I think, I think in, in a situation like this, it's fine. I, I don't mind. You know, you've got one actor in a consistent role across the film. 
uh, not a big deal. But I, you know, with the Mandalorian, my big problem with that is that it removes the ability for a new actor to step into that role. And I know that Luke is very much, you know, Mark Hamill's role. But if if we're going to keep rehashing him, mm. we need to get to the point where we're not relying on Mark Hamill to be, especially digitized versions of Mark Hamill, uh, to be the, the, the version going forward of that True. character. Right, right. True. Yeah. There's a there's a little bit of a controversy over this idea of, you know, that line between the human being and the and, you know, and the digital creation. And, you know, there was some of those Star Wars movies were a part of that, which is, you know, the recreation of Tarkin and, and Leia or uh, this recreation of Luke and that. Whereas this is it's Billy Bob. He's sitting in the chair. He's there present acting. They just make him look a little different. And so there's this this gray area, if you, if you will, of, <laughs> oh, of, yes. of, of that. So um, it, 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 I, it was kind of distracting to me. It, I thought it looked kind of bad, but. You know, it was a it was a brief scene. It wasn't a big deal, uh, but uh, no, no. You know what's worse though is that you know, the gray man's guy in uh, I think, and I think it's even yeah, it's Fitzroy is English in the books. He's not Billy Bob Thornton. You know, Southern drawl. <laughs> you know, uh, you know Clinton guy. He's well, you know, yeah. He's, and he's, he's not he's, even a CIA. He's he's like a he's a in the books he's a broker for independent you know assassin you know for right. mercenaries essentially right and he's exactly. a, a broker so it's kind of yeah it, it kind of undoes that and i'm not sure why but there's still this element where fitz in the books fitzroy is captured and held and his family is needs to be rescued so some of those elements are there there's a castle that that uh gentry has to break into at the end uh there isn't a a female agent with him that was added. Uh, of course, uh, that's what we do these days. But I mean, although Anna de Armas was was good, I, I gotta say she's very good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I've liked her in everything she's been in so far. Like right from Knives Out on. I mean, she's been really good at uh, what she does. Um, we've got so we have the Fitzroy. He recruits him, and there's this program where they recruit guys who are in prison for s serious crimes who show skill <laughs> shall we say and Pro uh, promise <laughs> promise yes but are not like uh maniacs i mean that that's the thing to get into is like gentry well, he's in prison because he killed uh an abuse his abusive father um it, to, to save his brother and he went to prison for it um which is also i think out of the books no wait he didn't kill his father in the books did he i don't i don't remember no, I don't know. Yeah, you. yeah. He, yeah, he, but it was. I know his brother died in the books, but I don't know. He had a brother in the book. And yeah, obviously, he had a brother in the movie, too, but his brother died in the books. So I don't know how. I don't know what the. They've taken a lot of liberties with the, with the, with the, with the books and the script and the characters. And it's, uh, you know, that's one of my complaints about the whole thing. Yeah, it is not the Gray Man novels. Let's put it that way. And the character even, and let's let's talk about that a little bit. Uh, and Thomas, you haven't read the book, so you have a different perspective. Right. So yeah. uh, you could give that to us too. Uh, but yeah, I, I kind of agree with Father Chip in the sense of this is not the court gentry of the books. It's it the 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 six in this movie is is different. He's very different. Bit. Yeah. yeah. Um even to the like he's almost like almost too unemotional. Gentry is not unemotional. He's he's a very Jack Bowerish kind of character. He takes a lot of damage, keeps rolling, that sort of thing, which is what Six does. But the emotions are different. Um, but I still really like the movie. I still really enjoyed the movie, and on for its own sense. Oh, I did too. Yeah, yeah. I, I felt like I felt like it was it was a good kind of uh, born style romp you know and that's that that's there there's there's two different layers of espionage right and there's there's these this gray man assassin kind of thing where he he's just boy scout capable right he's always prepared for everything uh he's gonna he's gonna figure his way out of some you know the shoe bomb scene for example in this one where it's just like this very clever use of of the limited resources he has and i love that kind of stuff i eat that up because that that's me you know i walk into a room and i look where are the exits where's the what kind of resources do i have and that's just the way kind of the way I, that i've built myself and the way that i think so i love seeing that kind of thing play out 
Um, but then, you know, the other, the other side of espionage is that you're not supposed to be flashy. Right. <laughs> right. That's, it, it, I love watching these because I'm like, if this was the way the espionage actually went down, the world would be a very much different place. <laughs> right. Right. And that's a big part of Gentry's character in the books is that he's not flashy. He doesn't tries not to make a big splash. Now the bad guys sometimes do, but he tries to stay under the radar, uh, which is one of the interesting aspects of the, of the novels, but it's a big blockbuster movie. You have to have these big set piece, you know, action sequences. So um, they, you know, it's a nod to that. Um, so we let's talk about some of the other characters. We have Denny Carmichael, who's the bad, the big baddie. He's also the big baddie in the first, uh, uh, uh Grayman no uh, novel. Um, and in this, he's, like a wonderkind he's like late late twenties, maybe thirty years old um who has risen to become director of operations for the c i a at such a young age, which is ridiculous, but okay, unheard it's, of yeah, yeah. <laughs> impossible, but okay, um, who has done some bad things and wants to clean house or is cleaning house on behalf of somebody else i think is is kind of the implication, so maybe that's what we're gonna see in the next movie is who that is maybe Matt Hanley from the books. Um, so uh, we have uh, this, this start off with this mission where he's been sent to kill this other guy and recover something from him. And it turns out that guy is Sierra four. So uh, in this, it's, they're not a, a wet work team. They're just in, they're just made like double O's like they're the American double O's, you know, right. license to kill, which is alluded to in the, <laughs> in the movie. I thought that was, a cute way to introduce that as well. <laughs> yeah, later on he says 007 was taken. Yeah, um, yeah. So we have this this thing where Gentry has to, you know, he he tracks down, and we have this amazing fight scene in the midst of a fireworks pit where these fireworks, like major fireworks, are shooting off like out of the out of the mortars all around them as they're fighting, and you know that's like I knew that someone, usually the bad guy, was going to get his face in front of one of these mortars going off. Right. It's just you know. <laughs> It's a given as soon as they, they're there. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so th uh, there, there was this opening scene and we get a sense of who Six is right away because he won't take the shot when this the potential of collateral damage, especially a kid. So we establish early on that he has a moral sense that his boss doesn't, Carmichael. Uh, so uh, and then we have Carmichael, we have Suzanne Brewer, and then we have... Uh, Anna de Armas' character, which I don't remember her name. Um, uh, oh, okay, thank you, Danny Miranda. Uh, and uh, Brewer and Carmichael are back in Langley, and Miranda is on the on the ground with with uh, Six. And so we have this scene, and this we really establish early on. You know, Carmichael is the just the prototypical you know bad guy CIA executive, right? I mean, we've seen this in in Bourne movies and hundreds of times. Yes, what in fact. Didn't Billy Bob play that in the Bourne movie? One of the Bourne movies? I think oh, he. Oh, I don't know. I think I, I think I remember him doing that. It's like it's just, there's always that that guy, you know, that the yeah the bad CIA yeah. boss. That's uh, true. Yep. Yeah. So the, the let's see, it's Fitz Fitzroy uh, is on the outs now. He's actually retired. He's left the CIA. And after this the whole operation goes goes wrong. So, so um six has this fight with four. Four tells him that you're 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 gonna be next. They're coming for you next. Here, take this this uh thumb drive. It's got all the data on it. And uh six runs and calls Fitzroy, who's in um one of the former Soviet republics. I forget which one, but uh uh Kazakhstan, I think, or something. And um he, you know, he Fitz tells Gentry that retirement was never going to be in the cards for the Sierra program. And he's probably in line to be killed. Um, and so what it's, so I, I say all that just to kind of establish this idea of this, the world that this character lives in. It's a world of, you know, where he has no hope. You know, the, 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 the end is he's going to run, run, run and kill in, in, in violence in the name of this program that he's employed in. With, it's essentially he moved from regular prison to another kind of prison. And I think that's an interesting character study. Like what, how, how, how does a man live like that? Uh, anyway, what do you think? Yeah, I, I think um, that, you know, it, it's, it, it's obviously deeper in the printed word, but I think that's going to probably be something that comes out more in the next 
couple of movies if they do more than one. And uh, I think, you know, that that man with no hope is always a dangerous man. And I think that's that's why uh, some of these guys, you know, are so valuable in this in this arena is because they don't they don't care. They just kind of go in and if they die, they die. They don't. <laughs> They're not worried about it. Um, I, uh, and maybe you guys, prob- I worry about that. <laughs> I don't, you know, right. like, I'm not a dangerous person. <laughs> so I, uh, I often, you know, if I'm driving and I see somebody driving erratically or something, I often get tense because I'm like, oh, man, this is not how I want to go, you know. And, uh, and I don't think court gentry, ha- gentry has that, uh, you know switch in his head um and so it makes him dangerous not only to the uh his targets but to his uh employers uh especially once he sees what's on the drive in this movie and he knows that it's information that will hurt carmichael um then he knows that you know something bad is going on and he's he's been a part of it um it it I, I don't know. I, I mean, I don't know how to live without hope as a priest and I, I, I and, and as a Christian. So uh, I'm not exactly sure. Like, I, I've never had that emotion, you know, <laughs> never had that thought process in my head. And so it's so it's hard to 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 kind of grasp and it's hard to, um, you know, see in a person, you know, even though it's just a movie, it's it's sad in a way because all he knows is violence. Yeah, and I, and I think it's it's interesting because it's it reduces the person almost to an animal, right? Where they're they're living on instinct, and his instinct is just really good at his his survival instinct, you know. And so so he's got all of these pocket these caches of of money and of uh, passports and things that he can go to, and um, and assets that he's developed himself that are useful for his for his profession. But it really, when it comes down to it, all of that is just there as fallback none of it's there as a plan it's all there as as a resource for completing whatever the next task might be and so it's just this very instinctual moving through the motions and you, and you see that really when he when he decides that he's not going to you know that he does have a, a qualm about uh taking out the target when the child's right beside him he puts the gun aside uh says that there was the, the fault of the gun jamming but then he goes out and he completes the mission kind of on that instinct where he just grabs random items that he can use to to murder the uh the bodyguards as he goes along trying to get at this target that he has right right and and it's there is that one human element that one human connection with the little girl that really is the is the thing that keeps him from completely being you know inhuman in a sense i mean it's the it's the thing that you know Without that little girl, and, and you know, he might not have gone for back for Fitzroy because Fitzroy's a big guy, and he knows, you know, what uh, the 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 price of the profession they're in, et cetera, et cetera. And you know, too bad for you. But for the but for the sake of that girl, he goes. So there's that connection that he made with her, and I think it's interesting to show how that human connection, that that, that fatherly instinct, in a sense, you know, that he that he probably has. Uh, that drives him forward. So uh, kind of interesting. Yeah. And we're talking about his niece, Fitzroy's niece. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. He, um, there's clearly a protecting, you know, something in him. He, wa- he, 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 he saw it with when he, with his brother too, obviously he was trying to protect his brother. He clearly has um, a soft spot for children and the underdogs. And, uh, and I think that's, that's, you know, a, a good quality to have, obviously. Um, he, in the, in the books, his, his, he was sort of, in the books, he's kind of like Robin Hood, you know, he kills people that only deserve to be killed. Right. And that's kind of his, his modus operandi, uh, at least so far for me, I'm, I'm not all the way through the series, but, um, so anyway, uh, I, I think it's, you know, I think there is something of a human in him and he understands that he's not normal, I think. Right. There's actually uh, one in one of the books, he is in, on the, in the midst of a mission and comes upon a, uh, a, a brothel that's being run by, you know, near he's on his, he's hunting down this uh, Serbian war criminal or something like that. And he comes upon a brothel in the 
processes and it completely derails him because he has to save these women like it's against his better judgment against everything that his instinct tells him he should be doing for this complete mission <laughs> you know for his own survival he decides to take on these you know the serbian uh, mafia or or albanian or whatever it is right and uh and and you know and rescue these these poor women and that's that's one of the things that makes it an interesting and compelling character to me is he mm -hmm. goes against that type. And there's still there's, you know, like Luke says of his father, there's still good in him. I know it. You know, mm -hmm. there's still good right. in court gentry. And you and I'm I'm glad to see that it's there in this character. That complexity is in this character. So that's another thing I recognize from the books yeah. in the character. Yeah, that's a and that's a that's a uh, obviously a quality you want in a hero. I think someone mm -hmm. who's able mm -hmm. to distinguish between you know good guys and bad guys and some sense of right and wrong. Um, you know, obviously not a deep sense. He's, <laughs> he's <laughs> right has no no issue shooting somebody um, or whatever to get them out of the way if they're in, if, if they're bad people. And that's the thing; they have to be either like bad people or professionals, you know, and he's, he's able to make that distinguishing, you know, that, that distinguishing um, idea in his head. He, he distinguishes between good, good people and bad people. And I think that hopefully that will continue in, in, in the movies as well. Um, I wish they, I honestly, I would have, wouldn't have minded them casting a lesser known actor and making it a series. I think that would have been a deeper way of studying the character, in my opinion. But um, you know, there's no way to slowed it down a little bit, right? <laughs> right, exactly. And 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 you could have told more of the story of who he was, how he got there, who his you know people around him were, because this is what they do in these in when they take a, something like this and they kind of shorten it down or they take stuff out of it. They did this. I, I don't know if it was Netflix or whoever. Who I think it was Netflix. They did it with Spencer. Uh, the character Spencer from oh, the, uh, the Wahlberg movie, the Wahlberg movie. They yeah. they totally changed the characters, backstory, uh, the whole nine yards. And, you know, and it, it's like they had to because, well, we're we got to get a two hour movie out of it. So we can't like deal with all the backstory stuff. And so, you know what I mean? Right. And that's kind of what they're doing here. Right. Right. Yeah. That, that is interesting. I, I, I've, there are so many movies now where I look at them and I, I watch them and I say, this would have been a better limited series. <laughs> like it's kind of funny right. now that right. it's almost most movies would be better limited series. <laughs> you know, yeah. Kenobi was better for being a limited series than for being a two hour movie. Certainly for whatever flaws it had, uh, it would have been worse if it was a two hour movie. Uh, so I, I agree. I just like, again, I mentioned the terminal list earlier, the Chris Pratt limited series much better as a six or eight, I think it's six episode series than it is, uh, would have been as a movie. So I, I agree with that. I, I would have liked to seen them spread it out a little more. I wonder too, how much is spent on editing? Cause you know, they, they've, you know, they've got more than six hours worth of, of tape. Sure. Oh, movie. sure. Yeah. So there's, I wonder if they, if they did release it as a longer form, you know, maybe even just like a three, uh, three part, you know, just, Two, two, three two hour parts or that would be a, a really interesting look at the character you would get a lot out of it or six you know six episode uh, hour long mini series um that, that you you would get a lot more room for them to breathe because that's i i <clears throat> but then you run the the challenge with a movie like this where the whole point of a movie like this is that it's fast paced it's big explosions you know lots of really exciting stuff happening right on top of each other so you do you will lose that it, even if you have those big moments spread throughout the series you'll lose that sort of frenetic kind of uh right. impetus to finish <laughs> well i mean i yeah yes and no they could do it like 24 i mean 24 always seemed to have that's true you know like a lot going on and, and, and every hour and it was always ticking down to that last second in that hour and you yeah. always like wonder what jack bauer was going to do to get out of you Although, know, that one or whatever by about hour 22 or so, I was like, hey, when's it done? I mean, come on, let's, let's get yeah, this I'm day not, over with. <laughs> I'm not saying we have to do it like it's a, a terminal day or anything, but, um, you know, they could, uh, they could definitely, they could have spread it out over six or seven episodes or something. It is, know, I mean. it is interesting in the, in an era of streaming where, you know, 
it, whatever's on the service on Netflix is just there, right? You don't have to right. pay extra or whatever. Why, why do they stick to the two hour movie format? Like, why not do a three hour movie format? Like I can always pause it, you know, why not? You know, why we, they, they, they are keeping themselves constrained to particular formats that no longer really, they have to accept that that's what people expect. So kind of interesting. Here, here's my, here's my two bit idea for you. Uh, movie directors. Why don't you make a movie? that you release in the theaters, that's the two hour version, and then go see the director's uh, series. That's the whole, you know, six hours worth of whatever you produced. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's you great. show on the, on the streaming service. That's so that they can make the box office and uh, the streaming service gets something extra too. That's yeah. Great idea. That's a great idea. Actually. You listen to Russo brothers. Let's get to it. Yeah. Let's get <laughs> on this. So uh, we talked about uh, Gentry at six. So let's talk about his opposite, which is not Carmichael per se, but Lloyd Jansen <laughs> played by Chris Evans. Uh, oh man. Chew it up the scenery. Wow. Oh. What a bad guy. This guy yeah. was <laughs> so bad. Like as, as you know, as Robin Hood, as the, as, as Gentry is a six is, he is the sheriff of Nottingham. I mean, he is just <laughs> really, <laughs> Oh man. Uh, Guy of Gisborne. I don't know which, which, whichever you want to do, but uh, yeah, he. But he makes such a great bad guy with that little mustache. You know that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can't say what uh, what uh, Gentry calls him. <laughs> yeah. Calls his mustache, but it, yeah, I, when he said it, I laughed. <laughs> I thought, yeah, that's about what that is. Um, I loved Chris Evans in this. I thought he was so diabolically evil and clever and funny as an evil bad guy he was he's totally playing against his captain america you know eagle scout image and uh he was so fantastic and i mean he in some ways kind of outshone uh you know uh, uh gentry in this movie in a lot of ways and uh I wasn't rooting for him, obviously, but he, he's just so bad. You have to root against him. But man, I've never, I don't remember seeing um, Evans play such a bad guy before. No, I mean, he was kind of a bad guy in Knives Out, but. Yeah, I was going to say yeah. Knives Out is as close as I think we've gotten. But, um, you know, but even that, I think that was, that's a really good move for him. So Lloyd Hansen also uh, was in the first uh, Grey Man novel and is he he's this really bad guy who just keeps like he like you said he's funny but he's just there's no restraint on him he's he's psychotic he's a psychopath mm. he's right. a sociopath i'm not sure which is the correct one but he's one of those paths and <laughs> he, he uh you know he's has no compunctions to, like kidnapping fitzroy's niece to to use her as leverage and put pressure on him and you know he'll shoot people at the drop of a hat and so you know, he's got Fitzroy, he's got him in the car, he, they call up Six, uh, Six is picked up, so uh, Fitzroy had set up this um, team to come uh, get him out of Singapore, I guess it was, was, was where it started, on a, on a C-130, and in the midst of it, they, they tell the team, well, you've got to eliminate him on board, and then we have that airplane fight, which, yeah. wow. That was awesome. That was awesome. <laughs> that was quite a fight. It's a good thing it happened over land, by the way. If it happened, I was like, are they over the ocean? Like, no, no, they're <laughs> over land. That's good. That's good. Uh, man, that was, like, the, it tore the plane apart. I mean, just what a, an amazing battle with the uh, you know the the loss of you know the the uh, floating in air and flying around and parachutes and everything wild that humvee turning turning itself over on top of people <laughs> yes. yeah, yeah, yeah yeah oh my gosh i thought that was that seemed like more realistic than some of the fights i've seen in planes before you yeah know? yeah it it did oh, especially with the plane like losing altitude and them getting thrown up in the air um, and, you know, shooting through the fuselage and it tearing open. I mean, that's uh, a, a thing. Um, yeah. Um, that is a thing. That It'll is a happen. thing. <laughs> and uh, guys flying out and you know that one of them is going to go into an engine. It's just, it's, oh, yeah. it has to happen. It's a movie. It's a movie. Now there's an interesting thing is they put out this big contract on him. Right. And so they show like, these teams from all over the world coming to come find him and, and to get him. And I felt like that was a little overdone because when it turns out, it's just Hanson, right? It's like Hanson and his guys are always the ones who are there. Although I guess in Prague, there are a couple other teams, but I don't know. I, I kind of felt like it was a little, that bit was a little overdone, but uh, I don't know. 
Right. I mean, in the in the in the books, he does have a price on his head. Right. Right. So that that they've, they've, basically they've put the price on his head. Yeah. And and so everybody knows about it. All the the people in that quote unquote business. <laughs> right. I guess well, that's and it was necessary to do that in this in the story sense because that's how the passport agent catches him. Right. right. That's how the passport right. forger catches him because he knew that he was worth something. That's right. That's right. I, I did like after he, you know, he lands on the ground, he takes the phone call, he's in, in Turkey or something like that, and he needs to get to Vienna, and we see him on the train, and it's the very unglamorous aspect of it. You know, he's sleeping on the floor, and he's eating, f like, whatever food he could find, you know, it's just, it, it's, he's not James Bond dining in the, you know, in a tuxedo in the dining car, you know? <laughs> no, no, he's not. And and that's actually something, I, get, I, I keep bringing up again out of the books, is like, uh, the character of the books, he always sleeps in the clo in a closet wherever he's staying. Like he lay, he sleep like he doesn't sleep in the bed because that's where they expect him to be. If they come for him in the night, he's not going to be in the bed. He sleeps in the closet. And it's kind of the, it was, I think they were kind of getting to that, like that he had a shoelace tied around the door so that if someone opened the door, it would wake him up and that sort of stuff. So I like that detail. They had some really interesting details there. Yeah, the details were excellent. I mean, I, I overall, I, 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 I like this movie a lot and, uh, I think um, part of it was because, you know, it, it brought me back sort of to that first Born movie where, you know, uh, some of that stuff we hadn't seen in movies in a long time before Born did it again. And just to, to kind of see it, then it kind of it seemed like it slid backwards on me. And then I think it it's back with this. It's, you know, it this seemed like a lot of physical stunts, not like. A lot of the fake stuff you know um and i and i i think that that part of it is is missed uh, I, I, that was one of the things i loved about the old james bond movies is that they they their their tricks were real they weren't you know there was no green screen there was no you know if they jumped out of a plane CG. someone jumped out of a plane you know yeah, yeah. right and and that's what this seemed like now i don't know how they did it maybe they did it on a green screen maybe they didn't i don't know but i i it just felt sort of like going back to something with the physical mm -hmm. stunts. Yeah. Yeah. There's something which I that. didn't, which I enjoy. Yeah. I, I think it makes it, I think it makes the film better. Yep. I agree. I agree. Uh, so at about this part of the movie, we did a, we did a flashback to two years earlier where Gentry meets uh, Fitz's niece, um, right. Claire. And he's been sent to babysitter in Hong Kong while Fitz is off on a, another mission because somebody leaked information about where they would be. Would be. Um, and so we have this interesting, like he just does not at this point does not know how to relate to a kid, you know, and he's, <laughs> he's the, he's the babysitter. And um, so there's this interesting where she's trying to warm up to him and he's trying to warm up to her. And uh, at one point she asked about his arm tattoo, which says Sisyphus in Greek, which is a, a nice little conversation about the Greek myth of Sisyphus. Like, and again, that hopelessness, right? That Sisyphus was condemned into in, in, in the afterlife to constantly push a boulder up a hill, but never get it to the top. Every time he gets near the top, it rolls back down again and he has to start again. It's, it's that Sisyphean task as we, we uh, have in our idioms. Uh, and so it's, that's where, where six is his, he has a Sisyphean test. No matter what he does, he will never finish. He'll never get out. Uh, so I, I thought that was in, an interesting conversation. Yeah. And it's, and it's interesting that that tattoo came from prison. Like you were saying, you know, it, that was from prison and yet he's, you know, and the, his statement at the end of that conversation was, uh, she asks him, does he ever make it to the top? And he says, I'll let you know. <laughs> right. Mm, right. Right. Exactly. That's a uh, yeah, really good point. I thought the uh, the, the uh, teen actress was actually pretty good, um, Claire. She was a she had the had the right sort of uh, facial expressions and the, the scent. You know, when something was scary, she got scared. And, you know, I mean, it was. I thought she was excellent. I, I, you know, I mean, the other all the other actors are really good in this, but uh, you know, she was really good too as a kid. I mean, she's a kid. Sometimes child actors are too good in the sense of they're too adult. Their reactions, because they're actors and that they're they're professionals, they're mm -hmm. good at what they do. And so it doesn't feel real. They feel right. like little adults in a role. 
there was a little bit of that in her. I mean, it wasn't perfect, but I think she, like you said, I think she did a good job of, you know, being scared when she was supposed to be scared, but not like shrill, like ah, melting in my shoes, uh, that there was a little bit of steel in her, which maybe you got from the fact that she'd gone through a lot of trauma in her life, her, both of her parents dying, being an orphan, having to have a pacemaker, that sort of thing. So interesting, the the aspect of of the actress and the character. Yeah, yeah. She reminds me of a young Anne Hathaway. Like that's uh, that's, oh, yeah, that's what I was yeah, she does kind of look like. Yeah. Well, I you know who I was actually thinking of when I was watching the movie was uh, uh, Hermione Granger, the uh, mm. Emma what's Emma Watson. Emma Watson. Yeah. Emma Watson. Watson. She yeah. kind of had that Emma Watson face uh, and hair, you know. And so mm. I was thinking, wow, she kind of reminds me of Emma Watson. And I was I, that's what I was thinking through through the movie. It was. Like a young Emma Watson, not Emma Watson now. Right, you know? right. Although the Anne Hathaway thing, that actually she does, she looks a lot like yeah, her. She does. Yeah, yeah she, she does. Close. That's another. That's another one. Yeah. And I thought that scene at the end where um where she's trying to get back to Fitzroy uh and mm. you know and Six is trying to pull her away that was a really powerful scene and she it did was. a great job with that yeah oh, she was excellent yep excellent yeah that that sense of like the her last living family member like this is her world she's going to lose her world here and yeah i could i, I believe she sold it i believed it <laughs> oh i believed it i i believed it too dom i mean she was she sold that scene she she basically sold every scene she was in as far as i'm concerned yeah so they they introduced an interesting plot element which was very important as soon as i knew as soon as they said it that it would be important which is she has a pacemaker which can be tracked remotely you know and so i knew that that was going to be an important element of how uh six was going to find her uh so uh and then we have that scene where um she's if they've got her home from the hospital you know in the in the flashback and the guy does come in and try to kill her and uh six kills him but tries to shield her from it a little bit and she's like is everything okay and he's like just another thursday because she had said before in the hospital right when she was suffering from you know the thing oh it's just another thursday like this this is my life and he says the same thing. And that becomes an important line later on. It's just another mm. Thursday. Uh, yeah. So, so that was good. Then we have, so we have uh, Carmichael interviewing, interrogating Danny, the Anna Dharma's character uh, back in Langley. Um, although I, I get a pause here. Uh, this movie suffers from a, uh, from what a lot of action movies does, is, which is uh, apparently people can teleport around the world. It takes no time <laughs> to travel anywhere. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, so that said, you know, let's just stipulate that's a, that's a modern movie problem. We we they right. they do it. The, the, well, thing. you and I wouldn't want to sit through three hours of them on a plane just reading the magazine from the from the back pocket. Right. Well, so no, but you know, do like what they did in Raiders. Like, hey, we've traveled from here to there. It's days later. You know, just right. you know, do something where with time passes, it doesn't have. Yeah. Oh, so you you want the little line on the map going well, back and forth like in the I old mean, days? You don't have to do it, but you could. <laughs> I'm just saying, it, time passes. Like you know, we could just have this this movie could take place over the course of a couple weeks you know i mean right. just, it, it just well. it's there weird were a it's like, lot of place names there were a lot of place names in this movie yeah. yes. Like yes a lot of place yes. names they went a lot of places yeah they I, did. yeah uh, but so. it's, it's funny too because my, my wife and i we, we were joking about it because it's one of the little things that bothers us about watching movies uh the, the inconsistency of how you name a place so uh there were there were cities and then there were countries and there was no real difference between, you know, it's just like sometimes this, this event takes place in this country. <laughs> well, why, why were you specifying the city in the last one? But now it's just like, yeah, it's just over here somewhere. You know? Croatia, it doesn't really matter where Croatia, it's Croatia. Yeah. Yeah. There's no one goes some, there. Yeah. Some castle. I mean, what do you care? <laughs> That's right. Exactly. Yeah. Locations were excellent though. Oh, it's gorgeous. No, they really were. Yeah. Gorgeous. Um, so I was going to mention Carmichael's interrogating uh, 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 Agent Danny. And he is a total I'm trying to think of the word I can use. <laughs> There's a word I want to use that I, that I shouldn't use, but he's a, to, he's a thank you. Total jerk in this. Uh, just like the whole he keeps like pausing the recorder to threaten her, threaten her career. Like this idea that like you you have to it has to be true that you were cooperating with this guy in what he's doing. Um, and then he like invades her personal space, like puts his hand on her leg and, <laughs> and she's like, you need yeah. to remove yourself from my personal space and that whole thing. Um, so, yeah, he's such a creep. 
which is, he is a crazy. Do, it, it does a good job of illustrating the difference between uh, a professional agent, which is what you know uh, her character is, and and a person who's just let themselves go that next step of of not having the the rules. The, the rules don't bother him. They don't mean anything to him. So he opens with uh, with a with harassment, right? That's like his his opening is basically just you know I'm a man, you're a woman, and um, I'm gonna make passes at you right now because that's gonna make you uncomfortable. And she she doesn't allow it, and she immediately falls back into professionalism, and pushes the whole situation back into that professional vein, and and maintains that throughout, which I think was really a really interesting thing about her character, that real that that makes the ending kind of odd you know like there's this the the professionalism that she carried through everything uh she's willing to give up for the kid you know to make sure that the kid is taken care of and while i get that it it does it does kind of alter the character that she's playing right there at the end of the movie i think it, she was also a stark contrast to the suzanne character who right mm -hmm. you know let herself get up above you know, the, the grade level of a, an agent out in the field. And, and next thing you know, she's beholden to Carmichael, who's crazy and, you know, and, and all the bad things she's had to do for him, you know? Yeah. She's an interesting gray character. Speaking of the gray man, because yeah. she's, she's neither good guy nor bad guy. And she's in the fish nor fowl. You know, she's sort of an opportunist and, yes. you know, it, 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 by, you know, in the end, she's out there for her own sake and she's she she th she'll throw carmichael over the side at the drop of a hat but she's not friends with six either and uh also another character out of the books and that's that's actually true to the character from the books so uh it's very it's, she's an interesting character um so we have this scene uh he, he ends up in vienna and he's uh gone to this guy to get a passport and also to get information on the on the pacemaker to track him down. And this really weird dude, like with the round glasses, <laughs> yeah. um, who has this like, you know, this trap door. Like, <laughs> why do you have a trap door? But okay. What? You don't have one of those? Uh, no, I, would, hey, I, I want one. <laughs> if you deal with those kind of characters, right? If you deal with those kind of people and, right. and a bounty ever crosses your, and you've got the, them in front of your camera, yeah. you want a way to hold on to them, right? <laughs> I guess, I guess. And he dropped them into a well, which is, I guess, essentially what it is. And you mentioned that before, Thomas, like this, this really great, like where he uses the resources available to him, the 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 gunpowder in his bullets, the the sock, you know, the to um he how does he what does he use to cut the pipe? He uses some um I forget what it is. He uses I something to what cut it was. Yeah, cut the pipe, floods it out so that he floats to the top and then blasts it just at the last second as you know Lloyd and his his henchmen have shown up. And then we have this this great fight scene. Um where and then this confrontation on the rooftop, and what does he say? Um, the white pants, the trash stash, it screams Lloyd. Yeah. <laughs> like you must be Lloyd. Just that screams was, Lloyd. That was great. Yeah, that was great. <laughs> I laughed out so much at that line. That was good. I, do, I, I laughed out loud at that. Yeah. <laughs> and to to rewind a little bit, I have to say that my favorite part of that well scene is when he lays all of his material out in front of him. Cause that's, you know, that's what you do. If you're, if you're okay, I, I have no idea how to get out of this. Let me reframe. And he organizes everything and just lays yeah. it out. In what do I got? And, and he goes, okay, I can do this. And, and then he comes up with the plan, executes the plan. Done. Yeah. I love that part. I, I, I love that about this, ca this character, which is that he just uh, uh, improvises, adapts, overcomes always. That's, that's always. one of the, that's one of the key uh, aspects of this character throughout the books. And in the movie is he uses whatever he has available to him to, to get it done, to do the job, to, to keep going forward. And I, so I really like that about that. That was the emblematic scene of that. Uh, so that, yeah, that was good. Also Lloyd just, you know, shooting the guy uh, that who's, who earned the bounty, you know, he, he, he shows himself to be untrustworthy, dishonorable, all that sort of stuff in, you know, just who he is. Um, right. Which turns up later in the, in the, in the show when we, uh, talking about the, uh, the other operative that comes into the picture. Right. Uh, who is really cool. Well, yeah, I want to talk yes, about him a we'll, sec. We'll get, we'll get to that. <laughs> uh, so then we have um, Danny comes to 
the rescue. She shoots Lloyd in the butt with a trank dart. Um, <laughs> that, which was was, great. that was another funny scene. It was just oh, so funny. That was so funny. <laughs> like he just like he's like he's just kind of mad as he passes out. <laughs> yeah, that was great. He was Evans was, and then he carries really it through goodness. afterwards. You know, like when he wakes back up and gets back to the chateau, he's he's still mad about being shot yeah, in the butt. Yeah, exactly. And I love the I love that he's limping through it. Like like I yeah. uh-huh. I, I I get the feeling it was Evans who decided to limp. Oh yeah, like yeah. through it. Oh yeah. Um, and you know he and Suzanne confronts him for like, what are you doing? You're a you're a loose cannon. He's like, I can do all the things that the agency can't do. Um, and you know, and you and you your hands won't be dirty for it. And I'm thinking. But they're hiring him. They're doing it. <laughs> like mm-hmm. there isn't really a separation. The agency they can has disavow. Paid you. They they disavow. That's all. They except, don't know. Except other agents are standing around there and whatever. Well, but that's what ends up happening, right? Like in the, in the end, it's oh, how could this guy have stolen all of these resources and and used them? And so that's basically how they get off. Is essentially saying, well, he stole the resources from us and then just went went uh, off the rails. Right. So. Right. I guess <laughs> right. so. I guess so. Um, so from Vienna, they head to Prague, where um, th- this Margaret Cahill, another retired agent, uh, colleague of Fitzroy uh, is, and she's she's uh, dying. She's a terminal cancer. Um, but they're going to go to her for help and resources. He had sent the data card, the thumb drive to her from Singapore to as a safekeeping so that he couldn't, you know, if he got captured, he wouldn't have it on him. Um, and so she has that. So they go to her. And but of course, uh, Hanson tracks tracks them to her place, uh, but she she goes down kicking like she get, lets them escape mm. out the back door, <laughs> and uh, and she stay but she stays behind and she's got the oxygen. It's not the oxygen tanks that she blows up though. It's the it's the it's gas the stove. Gas. Yeah, okay. yeah. She had turned the gas stove on and, and let it go. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so the the place explodes now. <sighs> Uh, at at this point, I'm thinking, where are they? like in the, all these movies, I always wonder where are the cops. You know, like mm-hmm. why are the police never there? Well, they show up at this point, and and six is is arrested. Um, he's you know they chase him down and arrest him in this middle of the square, and they chain him to a bench, <laughs> and that's when uh, all of these Alpha Team, Bravo Team, and Charlie Team of of mercenaries start showing up and like, shooting everybody <laughs> and so he, he's chained to the bench which and it's just really awesome these sorts of things work really well when the when the hero has constraints and he has mm-hmm. constraints at this point mm-hmm. uh and so i that this this scene this shootout in the square is just phenomenal it is that's one of the best scenes in the in the movie as far as action goes but the the funny thing the thing i was thinking of was like Man, it would have been a bad day to be a tourist in, in that neck of the woods. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're, you're probably dying <laughs> at that right, point. Right. Um, oh, gosh. Yeah. They go to the hospital later and there's just all, right, all just those full people. people. Yeah. 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 The, the, the mercenaries are shooting indiscriminately. Well, and I love the fact that he tries to clear the square beforehand, though, right? Right. He, so he, he tries to tell the police, he's like, look, you need to clear the square. You need to clear the square. And they're like, shut up. And so then he just grabs one of their guns and shoots it in the air, knowing he's about to get punched, you know, and, and you know, knocked back for that. But he does it anyway because he wants to try and save as many people as he can. And that goes back to that, you know, showing that that he's still he's more human than the, the people that he's fighting against. Right. And and he's and also like this, you see. Things don't always go well for him. I mean, he, the things go wrong and he gets, you know, in, in these bad situations and he has to, again, adapt and overcome. And, and so I really like, you know, the, 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 that the character that way. Um, so he escapes from the from the, the, the handcuffs and ends up on this train. This is like one of those uh, uh, tra- uh, trolley cars, you know, modern trolley cars. And uh, then you have this fantastic tr- shootout on the train at one point he's on the roof of the train and the guy, bad guys are <laughs> underneath him and he shoots through the roof based on the reflection in the windows of the Window. buildings are passing. I'm like, mm-hmm. this yeah. is yep. a, a brilliant directorial idea, like a brilliant action di- directorial uh, idea. Yeah. And you, you wonder, is that possible? <laughs> you know, because I, I, you never know what's not possible and what's possible in these movies. Cause the, you know, it's that nature of that, that work, but, um, you know, I don't know a lot of guys who shoot anymore. And uh, so just to understand, like, is that is that something that someone could really do in a real life situation? Like, I, that? Don't, I don't know that you could shoot through the roof of the train accurately. I, d- I don't know. 
It's kind yeah, of yeah, probably not accurately. Yeah. yeah, because it's not a uniform thing. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff up there. I don't know. Right. It's, yeah. No, but it was great. Yeah, it was great. And uh, he he ends up taking like Jack Bauer levels of damage throughout this. Like it. it oh yeah. In the next scene, we talk about like they end up in the hospital because they're going to they're at the hospital to try to use this information about the pacemaker to find out where the girl is, um, and that's when. Uh, the lone wolf shows up. The uh, this this uh, Tamil uh, guy, um, and he shows up, and he's like, he's a, a match for for six. Mm-hmm. I mean, he is yeah something else. It, and it starts by stabbing him through the hand with a knife. Six right. steps, through, and it's like, oh my gosh, like ow, <laughs> like how, yeah. how do you function after that? It is wild. Um, and they they have this battle in the in the hospital, uh, which is phenomenal. Like, this guy is really cool. Yeah, you know what? I always kind of that's one of my pet peeves about action movies is people get literally punched in the face or get swung at it by, by a, and get hit in the head with a uh, fire extinguisher and back they're back up in two seconds right. or a, a half a second. No, I'm sorry, I don't care who you are. If you get knocked in the head with a with a fire extinguisher, you're going down for a bit. <laughs> yeah, that's called a concussion. <laughs> exactly, real people. It doesn't have. And so that's one of my pet peeves about action movies, but I, I understand. But th- that's one of the things I kind of liked about this movie, though, was because the the six character, the court gentry character, he gets beat up, and it does take an effect. It has an effect on him. Yeah, mm-hmm. it does. You can tell. I like that that end scene when he's uh, when he's in the the fountain after the fight, and he's like, uh, "So do, can I can I do this over here? Because you know, <laughs> I, are, are, are we done here? Because there's just I, I'm, there's so much blood, <laughs> so much blood. You know, I need to like, sit that's down. <laughs> yeah, I really need to sit down. <laughs> oh man, yeah. Also, I like the fact that so he he and Danny are trying to chase this guy down, uh, going out of the hospital, and he grabs a shotgun out of a police car and throws it to her, <laughs> and she runs off. And he's like, he's got the bullets in the other hand, yeah, and she's like, Yeah, you don't throw the gun, a loaded gun. No one throws a loaded gun. And it's like he keeps saying this, like, don't throw. No one throws a loaded gun. And it's like that's basic gun yeah. safety. You don't throw a loaded gun, right? right? Uh, and it's kind of funny. It's it because because it, yeah, they're always throwing loaded guns in action movies, uh, right? So, it, but he's be speed safe <laughs> it was so funny though when she got to the shot and she didn't realize that she have doesn't anything, have yeah. any bullets yeah. it's like you ran off without the bullets like he's got it well, in his and, then she, and then she just stands there and he's like move <laughs> get it duck, yeah. duck, 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 yeah. push. and he's like well, you didn't move and she's like you gave me an empty gun <laughs> and the interaction between the two of them was just great on that yeah. whole yeah. scene really established that that combination of characters really well. Yeah. And, and, and it's interesting too, because uh, I really didn't think they were uh, given that her a lot of, you know, interesting lines until about halfway through the movie, you know, and then she'd be kind of, she kind of became a, a, like a three dimensional character. Um, Up until that point, she, she seemed a little bit, you know, uh, two dimensional, one dimensional kind of, Underdeveloped, uh, you know, yeah. Underdeveloped, yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting. I like because I, I really, really liked her not only in Knives Out, but I loved her in uh, the last Bond movie. She was oh yeah one of the one of the better spots of that. And um and then so when he made that crack about 007 earlier in the movie, <laughs> I thought, oh, that's a crack at the old 007. That's it. Because she, she was in 007 movie. Yeah, they, <laughs> she was a Bond. Well, and the two of them, the two of them play really well together in. Blade Runner 2049, they were opposite oh, right. each other as That's well. right. That's right. That's right. That was a good combination. So I was I was really looking forward to their interactions in this movie. And I it, it, it paid off. I feel like it they did a really good job with it. She's a good actress. She is. And she she can because she can do a lot of different stuff too. She can do the the comedy and she can do the action. She can I mean she she can do the kind of whatever she did in the Bond movie, which was <laughs> so cool because she was like one of the best part, parts of that movie. Um, so I, I, it's, uh, it's, she's really good. Can you believe she, like, I saw somewhere she didn't speak English until like 10 years ago. Oh, wow. I mean, she has like, she's like Barely a native fluency. Yeah. No accent. Yeah. It's wild. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's She's really, she's impressive. I, I, I'm seeing her in knives out and going, she's really impressive. Yeah. She was really good in that. 
So let's talk about the uh, the lone wolf. To the he shows up at the castle in Croatia with the uh, he's got the data chip that he's, he's supposed data chip. that he he was supposed to get um, and hands it over. And uh, he when he finds out that Hansen is uh, holding the girl, he's taken aback. He's like, you know, I didn't sign on for this. And uh, and Lloyd basically tells him like, you know, take a high, take your money and go, or you're going to get a bullet in the face. And that's really the turning point that that turns mm. him. His mm -hmm. honor is offended. And he he I mean, he doesn't immediately become an ally of six and Danny, but he ends up, you know, helping them. He ends up eventually he ends up handing over the data ship. Well, it was interesting because you could see the turn in his face. You know, he didn't he didn't say anything. But he, he, the look in his face, like the facial expression of the of the actor, really kind of nailed that, uh, you know, that sense of like, oh, wait a minute, this guy's a jerk, <laughs> and 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 is doing terrible things. He could even be a psychopath, and not, and that other guy's a psychopath. You know, what I mean, like he's a killer. <laughs> so they recognize it in each other. I think. Yes, <laughs> uh, I did think it was interesting how. Like at the time, I was like, "This is an interesting character, and they're doing some strange things with him." But mm. now that we like we we learn that he's probably going to be in the spinoff movie, it makes a lot more sense now. Like this isn't a like the, this would normally be a throwaway character, but they did so much with this character and then kind of let him be. And I was I thought it was weird, but that that makes sense now. Um, so they we have this assault on the castle. They, they Danny kicks butt. I mean, she, she's like yeah. she's having a lot of fun shooting rockets and stuff. Oh, yeah. And uh, and Gentry sneaks in the back door and and gets him out. And Lloyd's reaction to finding out that uh, Fitz and Claire have gotten away, like he's so mad, he starts kicking the corpses of his guards and shooting yeah. them. Like, Idiot! Shooting jerk. his own guy. <laughs> <laughs> he's so yeah. such a psycho. He was uh, such a psychopath. Uh, so uh, Fitz ends up sacri sacrificing his life. Um, you know, he gets shot, can't go on. Uh, so he takes the, he does the classic, the grenade, you know, booby trap. Uh, you know, when they when they show up, uh, Lloyd, by the way, uh, you probably noticed, grabs one of his guys and pulls him in front of himself to save himself. You know, to, yeah, right. I noticed that. Yeah, why would anyone work for that guy? I don't know, but <laughs> well, you know, the, there's nobody left to to tell everybody else that he's kind of right. a jerk to work with. You know, <laughs> I guess, I guess. And so then we have this labyrinth because, of course, a, a medieval, oh, you know, I know, a European I castle has, has a labyrinth. Um. And, uh, you know, he's running through it, chasing them down. And when they get to the center, then th there's this, you know, th you get the macho, no guns, we're going to do this mano a mano sort of thing, right. which is a, a bit of a, a cliche. Um, and Claire doesn't want to leave. But until Six tells her it's just another Thursday. And like, the, it's like a switch gets thrown and she's like, oh, okay, I'm going. And it's, I, I guess it's, Hey, for me, this is just another Thursday. I got this. It's it's I'm you know this is not a problem, so don't worry about me. Just go. Right. I, it's, that was my assumption. No, that's what it felt like, and you know, you know, she kind of got it. I mean, I don't know that she really wanted to leave, but she she got it, you know. And uh, he uh, and that fight that fight is uh, it's a good fight. That's a fun fight to watch on. This this movie had so many fun fights in it. Yeah. Especially after Lloyd got shot in the back by Claire with the uh, flare gun. Oh, yeah. I felt that. Oh, that. Yeah. Oh, <sighs> ouch. That's I think sting. we all felt that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was something else. Um, so, yeah. And of course, it ends with six winning and Lloyd being dead. Um, that's just the way it is. Spoiler alert. Yeah, spoiler alert. Although, at one point, <laughs> when they're fighting in the fountain, he does this thing where he like holds his head next to the to like a piece of the concrete, like a statuary, and then kicks it with his knee, his head into the into the into the vase, and it cracks. And I'm like, oh man, that looks painful. Oh man, yeah. Oh, that would have killed him. That would, yeah, yeah. That killed the lesser man. <laughs> yeah, both of both of them are invincible, and so you know, right. yeah. they're, they're, you yeah, just exactly. watch them invincibly go through this invincible battle against each other. <laughs> right, yeah. right. It's movie fighting. This not not yeah, the real yeah. world. Um. So in the end, Suzanne Brewer survives. Oh, I I, I missed the, the whole thing with Danny and the this uh the lone wolf, the Tamil lone wolf, uh fighting in the wreckage. 
and they're each on other each one's on another each side of a table with they've looped the, the the cables that they found around each other's neck and are kind of fighting back and forth with it it was just kind of wild uh an interesting fight uh there yeah, yeah. and then and, and it doesn't end until he gives up and says hey okay i have to take this i don't I'm, i don't want to fight anymore let's let's just call it a truce and that's you know he, he cuts himself loose and then then uh manages to say that to her so i thought that was I, I I agree with you on that. Like that's the uh, this I, I'm pretty pretty sure that this would be the spinoff character that you would have. Yeah, he's the well, he's the one that survived. Like who else could it be? <laughs> right. <laughs> There's not much else there. Yeah. Um. So in the end, Suzanne Brewer wants to put the blame on Hanson after she kills him because she's the one who does him in. Um. But Dan, both Danny and Six end up in custody, and uh, they they're going to keep Claire in a safe house in Virginia as leverage to make him compliant. So in other words, they're no better in some ways than Hanson is. Um, but he breaks out. I love the fact that he breaks out. And we never see him break out. Uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. you just see the, like they, they're going down to visit him and suddenly the door opens. It's like, Whoa, you know, this guy's on the floor everywhere. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, they go into lockdown mode. Um, and then we see at the house, the, one of the things about Claire is that she likes records. And so she goes into a room and finds a note on a record, play this as uh, on max volume, basically. And so that she won't hear him doing in all the bad guys. And, and so again, it shows that human side of him, that he cares about her, that, you know, he's, he's protecting her. Uh, and that's why he's there, obviously. Uh, so, uh, and that's, they drive off into the, sunset in the range rover uh and to to wherever that's that's my wife's big complaint about the end of the movie is what's the plan like she wants to know what exactly <laughs> he's gonna do with this at this point is he gonna like go hole up somewhere is he planning on continuing uh is he gonna go find the lone wolf and hire him as a babysitter while he goes off to do more <laughs> the gray man kind of stuff or what <laughs> right right i mean carmichael's still there and still he still got the data right he still got the data chip uh or does he Danny destroyed it didn't oh, he he no, destroyed uh, it. Carmichael oh, destroyed it. Yeah. Right. That's what it is. Okay. He destroyed it. That, and now they don't have reason to come after him, I guess. Like, you, it was probably the idea. But um, yeah, I think this is where, you know, that whole where he goes out and becomes, uh, you know, an independent contractor assassin. Um, uh, this is probably where they're going to go with the, with the next movie is that he's now doing that. Um, it'll be curious. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think they, they've got a lot of material to work with. So it's not in, you know, yeah, you know, with the books and and I'm sure they have access to Greeny and, and his thoughts. Yeah. Well, Greeny announced that, uh, yeah, he's on board with the uh, the spinoff and the sequel. So um, he's, you know, so he, he I just I love the fact that he's getting compensated. I love when one some of my favorite authors are they they're the rights get bought and they get compensated and they're going to be successful and they're going to keep writing. <laughs> you know, right, I mean? right, like keep writing, right. just keep writing. That's uh, right. That's, that's the important part is that keep writing part. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, he's he's good at this and he's um he's like Clancy in that he's meticulous in his research. He'll he he'll go to these places and he'll he trains with special forces and and CIA guys and like he he. So when he talks about the stuff, it's real. He knows what he's talking about. Uh, so I, I really enjoy that aspect of it. I'm reading a book by him now. It's not a gray man novel. It's called Armored. And it's about this guy who works in um, um, security, like military type security uh, firms. They are uh, um, high end security for UN peacekeeper mission in Mexico where they're trying to negotiate a peace between cartels and something like that. And everything's going to go wrong, you know, sort of stuff. And he's a very different character from, uh, six in that he's not the most capable guy. He's actually as a, an amputee who's hiding his, like he had lost his leg his you know, uh, lost one foot in an, in an accident uh, or a, an incident. And he's hiding it from his, you know, the guys he's working with. And so it's a very interesting character. And so uh, I, it's, it's good so far. It's a good book. So I've, it's called Armored. I saw that on Amazon today, actually. And uh, it was interesting because it looks like it's going to be a new series for, for Greeny. Uh, you know, that's his, his new series oh. based on what the Amazon thinks it says book one. So, oh, interesting. Yeah. So I think it's I think he's just starting up another series and, you know, probably, you know, they get bored sometimes, I think, of writers of writing the same character over and over and over again. 
Um, I know Dennis Lehane did because I haven't seen any of his uh, up his uh, that first series of books he did uh, uh, with uh, Kinsey and uh, uh, anyway they were Boston detectives and uh, they have, haven't had a new book in a decade I think or more. Interesting, yeah. It goes all the way back to Arthur Conan Doyle, right? Not not liking Sherlock Holmes. Yes, <laughs> right. And then exactly. Killing off. him off and then bringing him back. Bringing him back <laughs> right. or false? Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. And then there's George R. R. Martin, who famously will right. not write the last book of the game. Well, of he Thrones. just he just drags, man. He's just he yeah. he clearly is doing other stuff. Yes. <laughs> besides writing, yeah, clearly. <laughs> I mean, the guy doesn't need to do it for the money, I guess. So no, he doesn't need the money. Yeah. All right. So any uh any last thoughts about the gray man, uh, anything we didn't cover any notes that uh, you had that, uh, I, I don't have, I don't have anything, uh, original, I guess, but other than to say that I really enjoyed this movie as a, as an action movie. Um, I, as I said to you in a, in a conversation, it wasn't, you know, exactly what I was thinking it was going to be, but, um, but I enjoyed it nonetheless. And, uh, I think in less capable hands, it, it could have been, it could have been bad. And the, and, and this was, I just think it was well done. Uh, it, I watched it on Netflix. I didn't go to the theater to see it, and it, but it played as a theater worthy movie. Yeah, yeah, definitely. definitely. Yeah, and it, it felt it felt fine. It felt fine on the small screen. I even I would like to see it on the big screen, but it didn't feel like it suffered tremendously from no. being uh, from being on a small screen. So I think they did a great job. The lighting was amazing. Uh, the cinematography, the the settings were incredible. Yeah, uh, unbelievable. Yeah, yeah, it was really well shot, and a lot of care went into everything. I, I, some of the best moments in the movie are Chris Evans, uh, and you can just tell he's ad libbing that character uh, that as he's going along, you know, he's, he, he knows Lloyd Hansen in and out and he's got these wonderful idiosyncrasies that just make you hate the guy so much more <laughs> yes. all along the way. Yep. Yeah, definitely. And uh, rewatchable. <laughs> I'd watch it again. It yeah. was, uh, Oh yeah, absolutely. It, yeah. yeah. I would too. There's more to see. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. I think I'm, I'm sure I missed some stuff. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, all right, so uh, that should do it for now. We want to take a moment to thank our patrons who make it possible for us to create the secrets of movies and TV shows, including Cher W, Daniel C, Father Jeff H, Arthur D, and Jason C. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue the secrets of movies and TV shows and all the shows at StarQuest. And you can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. So that's it from us. We'd love to hear what you think of The Gray Man. Let us know by commenting on the show at sqpn.com slash secrets or the StarQuest Facebook page or send an email to secrets at sqpn.com or visit the StarQuest Discord community at sqpn.com slash discord. Until next time, Thomas Senner Ho, thank you for joining me and sharing the secrets of The Gray Man. It's been great, Tom. And Father Chip Hines, thank you as well. Thanks, guys. Great conversation. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to the secrets of movies and TV shows on StarQuest. <laughs> <laughs>